Yes, welcome back to Dylan Friends. Very exciting episode today of Teach Me Please, brought to you by our beautiful friends at Open Universities Australia. Now, Darcy Donk, yes. there's a lot of questions I get asked. You know what? There's actually not a lot of questions I get asked, but the one that I do get asked is how do I start a podcast? And what do you say to them? I say, I don't know. No, <laughs> I say, look, there's, there's a lot of ways to do it. And I think that people, maybe because the... The way podcasting came onto the scene, you know, it was a very like a rogue thing that you could just, you know, jump on your laptop and press record and not really have any flow. And there's the jokes around, you know, what do straight white males do? They start podcasts. Start podcast. and, you know, we are, um, for, we, we are the cliche of that exactly, that topic. But there is so much work that goes into starting a podcast and it is come it has come a long way. And who better to get on the show than Sam Kavanagh, the head of entertainment and culture at Southern Cross Osterio, SEA, which is listener, Triple M. And Sam Cav, um, for short, is is genuinely one of the goats of the industry. Like, this, this is a massive get for us to get on the show. And he's normally behind the scenes. He's, you know, extremely well known for his work um, in producing Hamish and Andy and working with that show for a very, very long time and also being a a big um, advocate for turning that into more of a podcast versus a radio because of the community aspect and being able to communicate with with the diehard fans more. And since then, as, as I said, he's head of entertainment and culture at SEA and sort of heads up all of those departments on how shows can become really successful, whether that's the production of them, how they're set up, who the talent is, you know, what's their identity, how do you, how do you set up a successful podcast and how do you make it different? And yeah, we go through so much today, which is really, really exciting about how to start a show. Um, I'm buzzing off this, even though you know I like to think I have some experience in this field. I still learned so much today on on all these things, so I'm really excited about um, people to hear this one. I think we might have to get him back in because I could have listened to that for another. You like that hours. one? Did you? You're I like, did. Oh, yeah, podcast yeah, content. Yeah, no, it was really good, really impressive. So we it. spoke about yeah different types of shows. So whether that's like a documentary <clears throat> style, a solo podcast, storytelling, two mates. We spoke about time specific shows that are in the now versus evergreen content that can last forever. We spoke about monetization. We spoke about building avatars of you know your audience and who you're speaking to. We spoke about the length of a show, um, knowing your audience. We sp- spoke about establishing roles in your in your team. So like you know who's who plays this role versus who plays that role. And the the um, the example we use is Hamish and Andy. You know Hamish is the fast and loose type operator. Andy's more of the um, straighter edge sort of guy that likes things organized, etc. So spoke about those sorts of things, spoke about the role of a producer um, and, you know, being able to put a show together and be subjective at, um, you know, story arcing and all these sorts of things as well, which is really awesome. Spoke about run sheets, um, so spoke about consistency and frequency of episode releases, spoke about how to grow a show, marketing funnel, social media, feedback from listeners, um, there's a, lot, a lot in there. There's a lot more. A lot. There's a lot in there. So it was a really um, beneficial chat that I really enjoyed and also spoke a bit about his journey and how he got there too. I think like a big part of podcasting is obviously you've got all the gear and the equipment and stuff you need, but we didn't want to get Sam Cavanaugh in no. and waste his talents talking about 100%. the minor things like that. So, so what we talk about with him is is knowledge that not a lot of many people get. And we, no. as we said, we are extremely blessed to have get him in, but I think something to maybe... Um, set you up even before you know putting a show together is well what equipment do you need so before we get into sam's episode i've just written down a few things that um maybe a a a cheaper or free version and then also maybe if you've been doing podcasting for a while and you want to upgrade your equipment i've got another um stuff about like what we use as well in that essence too before we sort of get in there because equipment is really um important especially microphones if there's one thing you want to sort of spend your money on i think it's microphones like podcasting is so uh competitive these days so i think that if you want to have a good podcast it has to be good quality in terms of audio um that's for sure so to get into that uh we'll start off the top microphones um i've done two lessons here as well so as i said a cheaper sort of version that you can get is um the usb microphone which basically just plugs into your laptop um, really simple to use. I've used these heaps. We use these at the beginning. Um, they're really, really simple, and they yeah, record. What was your sort well. of um, kit when you first started? Um, I used a USB microphone to start, yeah. and then I went to a 
row um it was called a zoom h5 recorder do you, do you remember those yeah, yeah so i don't even know if they're around anymore but they're I'm sure they are yeah it was bloody hard to use i yeah. had no idea how to use it it's called like an audio interface and i basically had that plug the microphones in and then i had these sure microphones but they were like the singing ones right yeah they were quite singing type um but they were great and you know they were super cheap i reckon all up that whole kit when i say super cheap the microphones were probably 50 bucks each yep but the, the Zoom H5 interface was probably, I, th- I actually do remember, it was about $400, which at that time I was like, fucking hell, this is a big investment. But not to get into my theory of investing, but I'm a big one in like, if I want to run a marathon, I would go buy some gotta shoes. Got to have the gear. I got to have the gear. Yeah. So it motivates me to go, all right, I'll put some money on the line here. I need to actually commit to fucking doing yeah, something now. make it worth it. Make it worth it. Wow. So um, the USB microphones, there's Blue Yeti um USB microphones that are really good. They're probably the industry standard in terms of USB microphones, but they can only be so good. Um, after that, I put together this really cool um, kit. I didn't put this together, but there's some really awesome kits um, online called the Rodecaster Pro. So Rode is a brand um, and Rodecaster Pro is like the interface that you plug it into. You can upload um, you know, your stings and audio levels and stuff. And basically they come with like the Rodecaster Pro headphones, a microphone and your XLR cables. So you got like the full podcast kit, yep. you buy it in one, it all works together. And they come in different kits, like one microphone with two microphones, three microphones, four microphones. And Jump you can in. get them all up. I reckon if you're wanting to start a podcast with more than two of you, like if you want to have three or four people on at a time, Roadcaster Pro makes it really, really easy. Yeah, it does. Like, we use that now. Yeah. Like we have them in the studio. Um, they are look it is an investment but they they're pretty look this is how much it costs it's 1800 for a single kit so that's just for one person and then if you want to get to a two person it's 2500 you can get 3000 4000 so they come to the whole sort of kits of like everything you need and to be completely honest if you upload if you use that equipment you'll never really need to upgrade again like they're no. very very good um, if people are wondering what we use we do use the roadcaster pros our interface um, but our microphones, we use the Shure SM7Bs. Um, I just really like the look of these, to be completely honest, and that's why yeah, they sound nice. we too. got them, and they do sound nice. All right, so we spoke about the microphones. We spoke about the Rodecaster Pro Kit, the Shure SM7B. Now, a really important thing that a lot of people may not know of is, is how you actually upload a podcast onto the internet and how it gets onto Apple, Spotify, all of these certain platforms. So basically, you don't actually upload it into into Spotify or into Apple. You upload it into a hosting platform. Um, there's a fair few of these getting around. You can do your own research. But from my research and ones that I know a lot of people use, which is a free one, is called Anchor. And that's just like a really basic platform. You make an account, it, you upload your podcast onto Anchor, and then that will send your podcast out to all of the relevant, um, you know, Apple, Amazon, all the places that it needs to go. That's where it'll go and you'll be able to see your analytics and those sorts of things too. Um, A paid version of that, we use Megaphone, which is like the upgraded version of Anchor. There's also things called Omni um, as well, which is another platform. And basically that's for people that are mainly trying to monetize their podcast too. So on Megaphone and Omni, you can actually like add in cue points and that's when you'll hear our ads we upload those ads into the podcast um, and that's how you can do that on one of those paid subscription ones as well Um, so there's some stuff there editing software um, you can pick this one up Dars because it's your expertise yeah so again there's there's free options or there's paid options Um, the free one that we've sort of you know recommended to a few people is audacity which is um, really simple platform. It's it's free to download. You can look that up online. Um, really good for recording audio as well. So if you need to, you know, record something externally, um, that's a good free platform to use. We use the Adobe Suite here at Producey. Um, you can use Audition or we use Premiere Pro because we're doing a lot of video work as well. Yeah, um, so that's a way, and I'm asking you this question now, I used to, when I was editing myself, I used to just use Audition, yes. which was just audio. You use Premiere Pro because then you can line up the videos, do the cuts and the clips and stuff as well, which is you know obviously yeah. what it's really important for. Well, yeah, video is a, a pretty big part of what we do now. So just having it all in the same location makes it uh, much easier, but... Um, audition, you know, it's the same sort of processes, so really as you use, but it is industry standard, so you're going to get that top quality 
um, output for your, your podcast. We speak about this as well with um, Sam, but you know maybe people getting into podcasts early, and, and this will be in the episode, think that you just record and then you put it up. But the amount of editing and the little bits and pieces you can clip up early are really important. You know, taking out your ums and ahs maybe to make it flow a bit more. You know, now we we like to leave our podcast really flowing well because it's our style to be a bit rougher but maybe your style might be to be really clean and crisp but you just got to work that out yourself as well and play you think around. we leave it pretty rough but i spend hours <laughs> chopping out your your arms and arms Mate, sometimes and your i ups. make some words like i don't see now it's not even working so just fix this up if you can um another really important one i get asked a lot is music and the sting so you can't legally put music in your podcast um that's against the law and obviously you're not paying a right for that as well so if you want to make like stings which is like the intro music you might hear like when you know mum comes on at the start or, or stuff like that you can get access to free uh clips which you know you can find on youtube or something like that it will say free music royalty, yeah, royalty free, free. Yep. royalty free music you can download um that which is you know very common stuff you might have heard it a lot around a lot before or what we use is something called art list which is A-R-T-L-I-S-T, Art List. It's a subscription. I think it's about 100 bucks a month. Um, I think it might even be cheaper than that. Okay. You're the one paying for it, but- um, I hope it's I think cheaper we pay that, annually. Maybe it's a couple hundred bucks okay. a year. Okay. Well, yep. that, that would be a lot better. Worth it, though. Definitely worth it. And you can access a library of millions of songs and you just, you know, you have a subscription, so you're allowed to take whatever you like. And we use that for all our intros and, and stuff as well. So that's paid. That's Art List um, too. So- they're the four little bits and pieces, and we'll set, we'll have some notes in the um, in the show links just to to fill that in for you guys. But they're microphones, uploading platforms, editing software, and music and stings. I think are the four sort of things that you need to get your head around. Yep. Um, and and don't guys, as you said, as I say, as a lot of people say, just fucking start. Don't worry about this stuff as a lot. Like I'd rather you just get something out and you can edit this stuff over time. Don't try and make it perfect, but as you go, the evolution of your show. Start weaning a few of these things in and um, seeing how it goes. Love it. Hey, let's get into Sammy Kavanagh. Loved this bloody chat. Teach me, please. Sam Kavanagh, how does that podcast? Thanks to Open Universities Australia, IlyXX. Have a listen. Sammy Cav, thank you so much for enjo- uh, joining us on Teach Me Please, my friend. How are you? Yeah, good, mate. Thanks for thanks for having me on, Dill. Um, as I said, as we were setting up, I'm pretty uncomfortable being on this side of the mic, but... Uh, yeah, bear with me. Mate, it's an absolute honour to have you on the pod for someone uh, as esteemed as you in this space. It really is a, a genuine honour. For those who, you know, love this series and love the pods, I always like to explain how we know each other. And I suppose for people out there that don't know you, working with Hamish and Andy and multiple other millions of other shows, working with Listener on their podcast network as well, and we'll get to your story and what you've done today. But I will say this embarrassingly, and, and not and not embarrassingly, but a little bit cringely or creepy, is I write down names at the start of my sort of journey that I'd love to connect with. And right. through that journey, your name was always right up on that list. So when we did connect, um, you know, recently up oh, in Byron wow. Bay, I was, I was really pleased to tick that one off and, and get to meet you finally. Oh, well, there, that's, um, I'm very flattered. Uh, yeah, that's, that's who else is on the list? Who um, haven't you ticked off yet? Well, I can't tell you the ones I haven't ticked off yet, but because that might be a little bit weird. Okay. But, um, it's a private list, so I can't actually tell. I can't. I can't share with you who's on the list. I'll let you know when I tick right. them off. I'll let you know when I tick them off. Give me. Give me. Give us one. Give, who is the most? Um, who is the most exciting name that you connected with that you had written down there? Well, I actually had a name. Sometimes they're not names, but they're like mm. voids. So, like, I really wanted a person that I could connect with that's going to be like a bit of a mentor and a coach for me. So, I like industry wise. Like, right. I've respected so much what you've done and how you've built. Um, an incredible career in in this space and as I said there's no one better to talk to today on how to start a podcast than yourself but another position that I've actually really lucky to um, fill in one of those was a good mate of mine Ali Tarai who's become a bit of a mentor for me and I didn't know who he was but he just filled that position and came in as that that sort of role so um, yeah it's been pretty exciting once you put something out there. That's a great insight into you and how you have created this this media empire like you actually sit down and think strategically about well who who do i need or what what sort of skills don't i have that i need to get closer to to learn learn about look again this is about you today but i will say this one more story <laughs> about me is it, it actually comes out a little bit of impatience 
And I always explain it to my um, my beautiful wife when we go shopping together at supermarket. Like she'll often just browse the aisles and feel like, oh, you know, where's the sugar? And we're just like walking aimlessly for ages. And I'm like, fuck, man, if we need the sugar, let's just ask someone where it is. Like take me, so take me to the sugar. Like I just want it like right now. So that's how I work with that's people. so funny you say that. <laughs> my sisters say that that is the exact same thing that I do. I just walk straight into a shop, straight up to someone who I think works there and say, where's this? Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's an analogy that's, for life though. Like I... I think totally. for me, like I could learn and try and spend, you know, hours, hours trying to research things. But if I can find an incredible mm. person that I can add value to as well, like I will try mm. and seek them out and bring them into my circle. Which is a nice kind of link to why I think both of us are recording this episode, because I think you, as much as I do, do get approached regularly um, by people asking how to start a podcast. So rather than send the same email three times a week... Let's have this conversation and have someone to point, have somewhere to point to when when people ask the question. How many times do you think people have asked you on how to start a podcast? Is there is there a number you could put on it? Do you know what the the, the question I probably get more often is, "Hey, my mate and I are hilarious. We think we should start a podcast." <laughs> so it's a statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, everyone says we're so funny. We, we've got mad banter. Um, so you know, give us a podcast. <laughs> have you realised how much? I suppose. It's incredible what you've done, right? But you've actually pissed me off a little bit too because you've you've made me f- you've made like every single straight white male that's funny with his mates think that they <laughs> could start the best radio show of all time. Like it, you've just yeah, given sure. everyone the impression working with an incredible production like Hamish and Andy that you've helped put together that any dickhead that thinks that him and his mate are funny can start a podcast, which you know it is true, and we'll we'll help him out today. Sure. And to that point, though, I mean. Yeah, I, I was very lucky to, to work with Hamish and Andy um, through the whole radio career and into their podcast career. And still to this day, um, I would say Hamish and Andy work harder on every single episode of their podcast than any other show or talent that I work with. Um, they the, the pre-production and planning and the amount of ideas they bat up compared to what ends up on the show, still I haven't seen a comparative, I haven't seen anyone sort of compare to that. So you're right, uh, it, they make it look easy and people hear them and think, oh, how hard can that be? You're just sort of sitting with your mate, making him laugh, that's a show. Um, but I, I'm very quick to let people know they, they work very hard to make it look and sound like it, they, don't, they don't put any effort in at all. It's, it's such an incredible point that I do want to come back to because first I want to give context to who you are, how you got sure. to where you were um, and how you got in, into mm-hmm. the industry. But that dynamic, I suppose, of Hamish and Andy, you know, we'll say it a million times today because it is really such a good blueprint for podcasting, mm-hmm. role playing. It's the benchmark of, of everything, really. It's not just two funny guys. Like there's, there's probably loads of people mm-hmm. that are that are funnier, but it's how you put it together, how you yep. structure a show, how you build a community. Um, all those other bits and pieces as well. But first, Sam, talk to us about mm. yourself. Was working in production always always a dream of yours? No. Um, I mean, I uh, yeah, my journey into this career is is a bit of a weird one. So um, it, I probably have to roll back to being a teenager. Um, I uh, was a pretty normal teenager, but you know, not without a few challenges. And my parents managed to get me into this this course that at the time was called the the Reach Foundation, still called the Reach Foundation. Uh, it was run by um, Jim Steins, who any of any of your listeners who are AFL fans will know who Jim is, legendary AFL football player. And uh, he partnered with a film director, Paul Curry, who was running drama um, workshops for for young people. Two of them came together, put together this course that was really all about trying to create a positive environment for young people uh, to help them work through their challenges, set some dreams and goals for themselves. Um, I was way too cool for it, but my parents managed to convince me to go. Uh, This is probably around sort of 14, 15. But what was really unique about Reach is that it was about young people running courses, camps and workshops for other young people. So by the time I got to sort of 17, I was then running those workshops and um, working with um, a bloke who's still my best friend uh, now, Jules Lund. He, he and I were, you know, do, running these workshops together. 
Um, and I didn't realize it at the time, but we were producing because we would, there's no more sort of honest audience than 30 teenagers who'll tell you something shit real quick. So we, we learned the art of facilitation and, and the art of creating experiences for young people to try and enroll them in, uh, in an idea. So did that for a few years um, while I was going through university. So I studied um, an arts degree at Melbourne Uni, um, majored in criminology, um, not sure why, it sounded cool. Um, loved going to uni though. It was, it was a really good experience. Um, but yeah, still working through Roots that whole time. Anyway, um, I promise I'm going somewhere with this, but, um, Jules then won a competition on Fo the Fox FM breakfast show. So Fox FM was the biggest radio station at the time in Melbourne. Um, the Tracy and Matt breakfast show with Matt Tilly and, and Tracy Bartram, they had this competition called the 15 days of fame where, and this is before social media, um, where the only way to become famous was to be on radio or to be on TV. Um, so they ran this thing called the 15 days of fame. Jules being Jules put his hand up for it, won. And essentially for 15 days, they put him on the radio, they sent him to events and they put him up in a hotel in like the penthouse suite of the Park Heights. So we were all over him like a rash what? staying at this. Um, yeah, we were staying at the Park Hyatt, mate, at, you know, sort of early 20s trying to get as much free beer as we could. Um, our other mate at the time, Hamish Blake, was also hanging around trying to just get free tickets and, and um, milk this, this gravy train as much as we could. Um, but it got to the end of the 15 days and, and the, the boss at the radio station offered Jules a, uh, a late night show on the station. So I think it was 10 p.m. to midnight on Tuesday nights um, and he asked me to produce it. And so we did we did 12 months and neither of us had ever really listened to commercial radio. So through our naivety, we thought this was a big deal. Um, whereas now I know not that many people are listening to radio at 10 p.m. at night, um, which is why they gave us the shot. It was like, you know, you can't really do any damage there so you can have that spot. Um, but we, yeah, we kind of thought it was a massive deal. So we would, and I'm embarrassed to say this, but we would work all week for this and we were doing other jobs. We we're still working at Reach. I was working in a, in a record store and we're making other money, but we were like, this is fun. They're going to give us this, this slot. So we worked really hard and managed to convince some, some, some fairly high profile guests to come on the radio show, which, you know, I don't think they really realized until they turned up. They were like you know, what are these kids doing? But, um, but I guess we impressed someone because at the end of that, um, I was offered a job on the, um, as the junior producer or the assistant producer on the, the breakfast show. So the Tracy and Matt breakfast show. Um, I'll keep going. Um, because then, uh, the show needed a, a comedy writer. Um, and I, my mate Hamish, who was the funniest person I knew, had no formal kind of skills in comedy writing, but had a joke for everything. And also just someone I probably wanted to hang out with at 4.30 in the morning, which is when our shift started. So Hamish came on and worked as a writer. And then he brought Andy and they then managed to talk their way into a late night show, which became um, a Saturday morning show. And then I produced that Saturday morning show. The Saturday morning show became a drive show and sort of the rest is history. Um, and I guess throughout all of that, we, we were listening to podcasts, all our friends were listening to podcasts. So we wanted the show to also be a podcast. And I remember a conversation with Grumpy Dave, who was our boss, Dave Cameron, who's the least grumpy person you'll ever meet. Um, and still my boss, uh, to this day, but he, um, we said, look, we want to, we want to podcast the show. And he's like, well, you can't give it away for free. How the sales team going to sell ads if you're giving the show away for free? But I think just we nagged him enough and he had more important things to worry about. So we we turned the show into a podcast and and I think even back in the, and this is like when podcasting had just started, so it was super new, but we knew like when we would go and do something as a show, like if we would turn up somewhere and some some of the crazy ideas we did as a as a radio show it was always the people who listened to the podcast who were first there so first to show up first to give us feedback first to you know call in or send in ideas so we just knew that although the radio audience was much bigger 
the podcast audience was much deeper and more connected to everything that we we're doing. So we were always really focused on looking after that audience and, and serving that audience as best we could. That's a really long answer, Dil. Mate, um, I love that. first question. Are we out of time? <laughs> Absolutely love it. There's so many questions I have off um, the bat for it. One being, is actually more of a statement actually, is when I talk with, um, you know, potential sponsors, we're always trying to bring new partners into the business. That's like always my number one pitch I say is like radio, yes, you're going to get a big audience, but it's passive listenership. Like people could be listening in the car and I'm not, you know, radio is fantastic. Mm. I'm not cheating on it, but it's people could be listening in the mm. car. They could be working and they're, they're somewhat there. But when you're listening to a podcast, you're going out of the way to choose to listen on a different app, putting that in your ear and you're having a mm. conversation with people that are so heavily invested into what you're saying. So I completely um, mm. agree with what you're saying. And that's where that community um, factor sort of comes into, like building shows that people want to be a part of. Out of all the shows that you've sort of worked on, whether that be radio or podcasting, what do you think builds mm -hmm. communities the best? As in which show has done it or what techniques have done it? Techniques. I'm conscious of this not becoming the Hamish and Andy podcast because there already is one of those. <laughs> It'd probably be funnier than this. But, I mean, the boys, I remember the moment I first heard Andy say it's the people's show on air and we'd been having kind of conversations and so look, this is my recollection of it anyway but we've been having conversations about like what does the show stand for what's our point of difference how can we be special different to everything else that's out there and the minute he said something 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 it's the people's show it was just that light bulb moment of yes that's what this is it's the people show everything we do well, let's put it through that filter and that meant things like um things like the gravy chip which was a i'll sort of reference some random ideas here that a lot of people probably never heard of but we made a, a, a flavor of chip that became <laughs> um a highly sought after um, product. Uh, we 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 bought a greyhound and and toured the greyhound around Australia, racing it. And I think we had like six thousand people turn up to a greyhound race in Perth. Um, we did the caravan of courage, where we drove a caravan across Australia a few times, and people could literally just join in and stay at the caravan park with us and watch the boys do the show. So all those ideas kind of came out of that window of it's the people show. So I think you know. The, it's, and to this day, if you go up to Hamish and Andy in the street and ask for a dollar, they'll either give you a dollar or they'll give you a bow, which is one of the longest running jokes in the show. And it, it's no coincidence that it's based on connecting with their audience. So, um, you know, I, I'm now, is that appropriate for every podcast? Absolutely not. You know, I don't think Abby Chatfield wants every single person coming up to her and asking for a dollar. But Abby has built her community based on also being super clear on what she stands for, being really clear on um, what you get when you listen to that show, what you don't get. And she's one of the bravest, most unapologetic um, talent I've ever worked with because she just is very clear. This this is who I am. This is who I'm for. This is who I'm not. And, I, and I'm not trying to be everything for everyone. Um, so long-winded answer, but I guess... Building community is about being super clear on who you're for and who you're not for. Um, and and the, the more specific you can be about that, the easier it is. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible answer. Sense? It definitely does. And, and I'm about to say something that makes no sense, and I hope it does. But this is where my brain goes with it when you were saying what you were. Now, we've all been around a campfire. I love sort of drinking with mates and, and having a bit of a chat. And I always get into talking about religion. And the fact that like back in the oh. day, you know, I'm not, I'm not personally religious myself, but back in the day, everyone used to go to church, right? Like that was that one thing that helped mm. people find connectiveness. You'd go there every Sunday, mm. you'd, you'd, you'd be for one thing and that was, you, you know, your religion, you'd go there, you'd be around mm. people, you'd feel connected, all those bits and pieces. Now, since that's probably changed and we've evolved as people, mm. you can now have your communities in all different places, whether that be like a football team that you will barrack for, you can be mm -hmm. something else, whatever that is. But now I find that podcasting is nearly one of those things where you can find people that you align with, your values align with, whether it be Hamish and Andy in that community sense that they have where they go around the world and anywhere you go, you feel like you're, they're your friend. Whether it be Abby Chatfield mm -hmm. that you were just mentioning and you know what she stands mm -hmm. for, 
She's unapologetically herself. People absolutely love that. Gives some strength, gives some power. So in a way, mm. I'm just like thinking out loud. I find that that's probably the same way. Like that's what podcasting is itself. It's a great example, Dill. I think, yeah, re- religion probably... <laughs> You're pretty good at building a community. Pretty good at um, <laughs> getting especially getting Scientology. To do now that's something we should talk about. <laughs> oh, that's something you said. If uh, whoever wants to, whoever wants to. No, you were saying you it before that. the show, uh, though. You- <laughs> no, no, I never mentioned it. I know they're fa- fairly active on the um, fairly litigious the the Scientologists. So you, you can own that one. But um. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, religion, yeah, absolutely. Great example. Could get people to do weird shit. Um, that's for sure. Um, I told you it was going to be a I'd weird answer. If, yeah, Matt, <laughs> I'd love if the title of this podcast can be Podcasting the New Religion. Love it. Oh, Let's man. Do that. I hate myself sometimes, seriously. It's, it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard but, to well, be let me. Let me ask you how, how have you, how do you think you've built the community you've built around Dylan Friends? It's such, it, it, it's, mate, it's something that I've had to reflect on a lot. And I, I just feel so grateful and blessed, firstly, to even have a community, which is, which is crazy. I don't have the answer for this because I think there's probably a way that I've done it. And I loved that you brought up the fact of Abby because I feel like we're completely, you know, different people. But in a sense, I feel like our communities come to us for those certain things, right? Like my values are all about like not knowing that you have the answer to everything because I, I don't. Um, vulnerability in the sense of just trying to get the best out of yourself and connect with other people, love human connection, love my mates, love my family, um, very broad mm-hmm. things. But I feel like that's the stuff that people come to me for um, or come to listen to the show do, for. But do, do you think that that vulnerability and um, vulnerability in the environment of sport and AFL is was quite a unique new perspective. Like when you think you've got, you know, I'm a big fan of, of Triple M um, and I listen to a lot of footy content on Triple M, but it is all about hanging shit, don't show weakness. <laughs> um, you know, if it, someone says something stupid, you're all over them. And then you sort of came in with this different approach, which was, hey, I love footy, love sport, love my mates, but I've also, I'm also happy to be vulnerable and, and um, and show that different side of myself. Yeah, I suppose I, I think for me it, it had to be like that because I didn't have um, a career where I could probably walk into a job like that. And I think that what I realized was the fact that a lot more people have careers like I do than the ones that don't. And it's actually quite a relatable experience yeah. to take the piss out of yourself, um, to have fun, to love having beers with your mates, doing all those things. But also you can have range and you can be connected to and your emotional side, your vulnerable side. You want you can want to be a good friend, good dad, whatever that might be. So I think for me, it's just been mm. honestly a journey. Like I feel like I'm actually not the host of the show. I just feel like I'm a part of the show, like, like everyone else is, um, never knowing what's going on. But- yeah, I suppose the one thing that it comes down to, though, for me personally, on the community sense, and this is like anything, is I think the main message today from me, I'd love to know what yours will be, but it's consistency. Like you can't build mm. a community if you're not consistent and you can't be relied on. And that's like with Hamish and Andy, like you know when you get in the car on the way home, like mm. they're going to be there. Like you know when Abby's podcast mm. comes out, you know that I release Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Thursday morning, Saturday morning. Like it's there and it's it's always mm-hmm. there no matter what because like that's how seriously you have to take it. Yeah, showing up is 90% really, you know, and um, there's a great quote that I'll, that I'll muck up, but I think it's from Lorne Michaels who really famous executive producer of um, Saturday Night Live. I think the quote was, the show starts – at 11 p.m. not because it's ready but because it's 11 p.m. <laughs> and and I think you know the live radio is such a great um, such a great training ground because you know the show started at four o'clock whether we were ready or not and there's so many things that we would have loved another edit or another try or another, you know but you, you've only got a certain amount of time and you you got to you got to publish when you're ready to publish and you're absolutely right I think a lot of people because podcasts are on demand, you know, there's a sort of, oh, it's not quite there yet. So I'll, I'll give it another day or I'll give it another edit, but consistency absolutely is everything. Um, but I guess if this is a podcast about, um, how to make a podcast, 
uh, I think, um, you know, building a community is one reason to start a podcast, but I don't think it's the only reason mm. as well. Like I think it's probably worth putting on the record. I reckon, you know, 0.01% of podcasts are monetizing or, or are, ma- are making money out of having a podcast. I think there's probably 99.9% of, of podcasts aren't. And so I think there's lots of reasons to have a podcast that aren't making money. Um, and, uh, so I don't know where I'm going with this, but, um, I think, yeah, building community is important, but you know, another great reason to have a podcast is, I mean, you and I probably wouldn't be having this conversation if you didn't have a podcast, you know, there's lots of other reasons. I mean, I'm pretty passionate about thinking everyone should have a podcast. Um, just because just the same way everyone sort of has pretty much everyone has an Instagram account right now. Not everyone's going to be a professional making money on their Instagram account, but it's a good thing for everyone to have because I like, I don't, you know, I like being able to see people's kids grow up and you know what so-and-so is up to. And, and I think, that's where I think podcasting is kind of going. I think it's another expression. Um, it's another way for people to share themselves online. Um, it doesn't have to be a professional um, business. Mate, that's a really, really interesting take. Like I've genuinely never really thought about it like that, but it's it's so true. And even from the sense like when people say to me, why do you do the podcast? I actually forget sometimes that we even – let these release like i just genuinely enjoy talking to people super curious yeah. and sometimes you just have to let them know that this is being recorded for other people otherwise like you said it's very hard or weird sometimes to just catch up for coffee once a week for an hour and a half yeah. with someone different so if you can sort of record mm. it let other people hear it it makes a lot more sense so one of, one of our podcasts is tofop which is will anderson and charlie clawson i'm looking out the window at, at my mate mike for 13 years is that how long the boys so yeah they've been doing Tofop for 13 years together and it literally started with the two of them in a car on a road trip and and sort of you know they were kind of friends but not super close they did a road trip together just pissed themselves the whole way and we're like how do we if we just we're not gonna catch we're not gonna have the discipline to catch up every week watch and then the idea was well let's do a podcast let's just you know it was a brand new thing not many people were doing them and it was that it just forced it gave them an excuse to catch up try and make each other laugh for an hour every week and that was 13 years ago and they're still um doing that podcast it's called tofop it's 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 a great listen but yeah the reason wasn't because hey we're gonna get rich doing this which by the way they haven't but (laughs) it was it was it was because it gave them a reason to catch up and i think when you're recording something you you show up in a different way you 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 know you might bring a better version of yourself um, you know, you're not looking at your phone, scrolling, thinking of what else you're going to do. You're actually engaged in the conversation. I think um, I've got to add this one in then because you've already sort of said it. But when you, I do have coffee with people and they say, you know, how do I start a podcast? How do I make it? Sort of maybe the third yeah. or fourth or fifth question is when do I start making money off it? And I always say, <laughs> yeah. this probably isn't the career for you if you're getting into this to, to make money. I think for the, like, you know, transparently, I don't think I made money for two or three years before this turned into a business. It was just something that we did on the side, but we never missed a week consistently and just enjoyed bringing value, bringing value to myself firstly, developing. Like I couldn't string a sentence together, not that I really can now either, but um, I just really enjoyed the personal development side. How do you think, um, yeah, well, I was going to ask you, what do you think, what skills do you think you've learned by doing the podcast? I think it's pretty hard now to, I feel like I would, I felt like I was always quite good at having conversations and talking with people just randomly, but I, I feel like now I can I could talk to anyone about anything really. Um, in terms of the emotional side of things, like I suppose there's some stuff that we touch on that I've definitely developed in my personal side. You know, talking about like whether that's my own mental health or my own story with family members, like with my old man or those bits and pieces, which I've actually felt has helped me a lot talking about. And resonating with other listeners, knowing that I'm not alone in those circumstances. So I think that there's been some journey stuff like that that's been really fulfilling. But I think the other side is just building connections with people like yourself. You know, how often do you actually get to sit Mm -hmm. down and chat with someone with no phone for an hour or so and just Mm -hmm. talk? Like it's, it's, it's probably doesn't happen. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? And what better skill is there than being able to connect with someone? Like I would say almost 
all my success and you know we touched on it earlier but you know working being being able to be part of the reach organization from a young age which was all about learning communication skills like almost all my success comes down to my ability to communicate and connect with people um and you know what better way to practice that than have a podcast exactly right uh we spoke about podcasting a lot now so there's some shows that are going quite well we spoke about obviously hamish and andy abby um listen has got in, you know an incredible amount of successful pods that are happening now we're always trying to build into that place as well which can be really hard right because i think you know i suppose even when i jumped on the whole 1v1 interview thing like that was sort of really towards the end of that being a thing like it was quite if people say to me now i want to start a show with one-on-one interview i'd almost say wow that's it's it's almost very diluted now like there's a lot of that going on not saying that it's not possible but it's quite diluted in that's in that space and i think you gave me you know sort of similar advice on that too which i really appreciated to help diverse my show bring in some footy stuff bring in some more um time specific stuff throughout the um the channel too how do you look at starting new shows is it to niche down or is it to go wide i mean it's to me it's always about working backwards from the talent so you know what is their unique point of difference what um you know what can this what can what's the unique perspective this person can have that i can't get somewhere else again this is if the if the premise is we're we're trying to build an audience to a level that we can monetize right um and as we sort of already touched on there's a hundred other reasons to do a podcast and and if you really just you know, this is a way I want to try and reach out to people that, that probably aren't going to have a coffee with me, but might come and record a podcast with me, then, you know, then maybe an interview style format is the way to go. Um, but, you know, just thinking about like, yeah, what is, what, as a host, what's your unique perspective? What can you offer that other, someone else can't? And you don't, ha- I, I can't remember who told me this, but it's always stuck with me that you don't need to be very different to be very different. You know, like uh, I think not wanting to embarrass you, but if you compare when you came into the podcast landscape, the world already had the Howie Games, which was one of the one of Australia's most successful podcasts where Mark Howard interviews um, sports stars. He does it incredibly well. Um, it's really successful. Um, but Howie's a is a professional, you know. Yeah, he, he's. Uh, <laughs> Where are you going with this? Didn't feel right. Yeah, <laughs> well, hang, stay with me. Um, but how he's, you know, how he is is one of Australia's most beloved sports broadcasters. Incredibly, you know, uh, experienced. So you know, and Dylan Friends is a conversation. So how he's doing interviews. You're having conversations. I mean, it's in the name of the podcast. It's Dylan Friends. So, and and when I listen to your show, that's what it feels like: two friends catching up. It doesn't feel like one's a journalist, one's one's an interviewee. Um, and so, I guess I use that example to say you you don't have to be very different to be different. Those on, on paper, those two shows look quite similar, but they're actually worlds apart, and there's room for both. That's awesome. I do actually really appreciate that. It's it's something that I suppose as well was like when i did start doing this it was probably a like without knowing it was probably a real generic copy of the howie games obviously when you look at it like it's two guys interviewing other sports people but as you said by the the person who's hosting it can turn into something completely different it's actually just getting started on something yeah it's all about your approach you know like i said Howie's incredibly well researched and and um you know he's one of australia's great interviewers um, where you're disarming people who are athletes and uh, and within three minutes they're just having a chat with a mate, probably sharing some stuff that they wouldn't share in a formal interview format. Um, so, yeah, so back to your question about format, um, you know, it's, it's less about kind of um, picking a lane and more about thinking about what it is you want to share. And look, the beauty of podcasting is it's, it's cheap. So... Mm-hmm. You can figure it out as you go. You don't need to have a perfect um, plan and concept that you've tested and practiced and and you're sure it's going to work. Like every show I've ever worked on, like you figure it out as you go. You something happens and you hear it and you go, "That's that's the show. That's when we're at our best." Um, and 
Um, also, when shit doesn't work and you're like, well, clearly that's, we're not very good at that. So let's leave that to someone else. One other part I'd love to get your opinion on, and I, I still don't fully have a grasp on this, but it's something that I've tried to build in to Dylan Friends um, and the rest of the pods that we do. And let me know your thought on this because each show we try and have somewhat of an evergreen episode versus a time specific episode. And I suppose the the meaning for that is if you look at Dylan Friends, the main episode with a guest like you could listen to that in a year's time two years time three years time and it'll somewhat still make sense it's not talking about what they do on the weekend or anything like that it can just be listened to whenever versus if you listen to the footy show we do or the minis that we do um, in the office they're relevant of right now like what's happening in the time on the weekend what's coming up on the 20th of you know september november in those bits and periods uh, in those bits and pieces so my opinion, my question, um, roundabout question is, what's your opinion on evergreen versus time specific? And is there a place where they can live in the middle? Do you give advice to people on what they should do and how they should base their show around? I mean, again, it's sort of, it's sort of hard to answer without thinking about specific kind of people and what the, what the goal is. But certainly evergreen content is really um, valuable if you're building a body of work that you want to monetize over a long period of time. So I'm not sure people know, but the, the way we monetize most podcasts is we, you know, the ads you hear, we sort of dynamically insert those at the time someone listens to it, not at the time we publish it. So, um, you know, if you listen to an ad on Dylan Friends um, tomorrow, you would hear the same ad through the whole back catalog um, as opposed to sort of baking in the ads into the content, um, which which is certainly f- for platforms like ours, you know that that's how we monetize it because, you know, you you can monetize the whole catalog, not just the the most recent episodes. So, y- yes, if you're building, if you're creating evergreen content, then that um, that content's going to be just as valuable in um, three years' time as it is to the the day you publish it. So. Another one of our podcasts is is Willosophy, um, Will Anderson's interview um, podcast, which he's been doing. We just he's just published his three hundredth episode this week. Um, looking out the window to Mike, who also produces that show, and um, uh, you know, I would say I'm sort of guessing, but I reckon about twenty percent of every month. Every month, I would say twenty percent of the downloads are not just from the most recent episodes, but also the whole back catalogue. No, I can jump about. in on that too. I so, know that fifty percent of our listens are the recent month, and the other fifty percent right. are from a month later, which which is incredible. Like when you talk about making it, turning it into somewhat of a business, those back catalogue um, episodes and time uh, specific versus evergreen content is really important mm-hmm. to do so, but. I suppose that's a question I always give to people as well because, you know, they might come in with not much of an idea of that. It's like, well, what do you want your show to be about? Is it – and some people mm-hmm. normally say, oh, we want to interview someone but then also talk about what happened on the weekend. I'm like, well, maybe that's two different episodes. Like you've got to work out is it mm-hmm. in the now or is it meant for people to listen to all the time? Great point. And, you know, so we've talked about the value of Evergreen. The value of Timely is, you know – in terms of like episodes that we publish that go viral, quote unquote, um, is generally always um, really timely oh, yeah. content. So something that is already in in culture or already being discussed, and um, and but for that reason, this episode has like just massively overperformed because people are sharing it around. You know, um, I remember I was working on the briefing, another one of our podcast a daily news podcast and i think the melissa craddock this is gonna get a bit gross but i think it was when her foot was found or you know you know the story i was um, all over that so we that quickly cool. jumped yeah i bet i bet so we quickly jumped on the, the show had already published i think that story broke around midday and we quickly got an episode out got a really good bit of social content to go with it and that just went bananas as people were so desperate for news about that so they were sharing it around um, and now, you, you know, so there is a lot of value in that, but um, it's much, it, that episode, you know, no one's listening to that today. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it's, yeah, they're, they're very different, um, very different approaches. 
it's it's a really really interesting point that's something that actually i'm just looking at darcy going why the hell aren't we doing that that's like such a, a good idea because i think for me I got, I got a little bit ocd with my feed being like no it has to be strict has to be monday this and yeah. i think once you've built that consistency and you've got those shows there's no reason why you can't drop in little bits and pieces like it's just a it's nearly like a facebook mm-hmm. wall that you can just keep posting on yeah i think less and less people are sort of just automatically listening to the same thing at the same time i think people are scrolling through they've got a few favorite shows they'll scroll through they'll see what what am i feeling like um so yeah i think you absolutely can serve different things to different people to really importantly as you mentioned though once you've already established what the show is who it's for what what you stand for then you absolutely can experiment and try different things i reckon as you're building something from the start i would try and be a little bit more specific and just back yourself in around an idea and see how you go building an audience around that idea. A really cool bit of advice I got a while back when I was looking at sort of um, knowing our audience a little bit more. Obviously, there's statistics, you know, you can look at who's listening, age, demographic, all those bits and pieces, but it was actually building an avatar of your listener and you might build like two or three. So, you know, we built them for all of our shows that we listen to, uh, that we, we produce, and you can sort of know who you're actually talking to when you do it. Um, so, you know, we were like, for example, Dylan Friends, there's two types of listeners, right? There's like Sam, who's 21, lives in Bendigo. Um, he's just finished like high school. He's gone to university, um, wears his footy shorts everywhere he goes. He, you know, <laughs> dri- rides his bike to work in and home, um, goes to the library after school, um, cares about his mates, loves drinking coffee, all those bits. So you sort of build this person out, what they look like, who they yeah. are, what their hair color is. And then another person that's, you know, Sam, he's 42. Sam um, is a career driver. He, you know, he's on the road all day. He's um, always listening to podcasts. He's looking to do X, Y, and Z. So it's like a really cool way of building out who you're actually talking to that puts a face to those names. That's a great idea. I think being really specific and personal um, with who your, you know, demographics are so... You know, they just so they don't really mean much. They're just numbers or statistics. So making it really personal and having, particularly because what you do is in many ways a team sport. So you're, you know, you're working with other people to try and come up, come together around a, a shared idea and vision. So, you know, being really specific about your audience, I think would be really helpful as you're working with your producers and your other hosts so that, you know, to be clear around what, a good idea looks like and what a bad idea looks like because that's the thing with creative pursuits is there's no yeah it can be really hard to say well whose idea is better here your idea or my idea or this idea or that idea so the more specific you can be about who the show's for and what it's for i think really helps speed up those conversations just as we were sort of referenced earlier the the whole people show that was so valuable because it just help this all get on board what are we trying to do here what's what's a great idea what's something we don't need to worry about um rather than it being you know arguing or or not even arguing but just you know having to flesh that out and discuss it every time you've got to come up with an idea love to talk to you about the role of a producer on a show like at a probably at a basic level for someone looking to get into a podcast and then the relationship Mm -hmm. between producing and being the host now it's a loaded question because I think when I started Dylan Friends, obviously was just had no idea what I was doing. Um, I finished footy, was really lucky to land a part-time job at 3AW where I was working as like a junior producer on some radio stations between you and I. Wasn't for me, didn't love it, but the value that I learned from actually learning how to put a show together, um, learning how to have a hook or learning how to, um, you know, bring people into the show, have a, a start, middle, and end, was made me such mm-hmm. a better podcaster as well. Totally. I mean, there's no better training ground than live radio because it's 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 a hungry beast. Like, it, you got to come up with so many ideas every day um, that it really refines your creative muscle. Um, because yeah, it's just constant. You're constantly thinking of what's next. What are we going to do in the next break? Um, uh, so yeah, I think I, I was super fortunate to start my career in radio as well because um, you know you think about maybe I always think imagine working in like on a film and it's like seven years 
or more, and then it's two hours and it's done. <laughs> Like I just, I'm, I just don't have the attention span for that. I need to be making lots of things and trying things and failing and trying again. Um, I forgot your question. There, no, it's a great answer, but the role <laughs> of a producer at a junior level, like if someone's looking to start a podcast now, because normally they, you know, without um, having maybe not a team around them yet, they might be the, the podcast host <clears throat> and a producer, or if they have someone helping them out, what should that producer be doing? Far out. If you're starting a podcast and you've got a producer, a, a producer you're doing well. Um, I mean, I think- well, You're just very you know, good at convincing people to do shit for free. Exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, so there's the technical aspect, I guess, of, of producing. And, and, you know, I've got one of our producers, Mike, Williams here because um, it's been a long time since I've been on the tools and, and I didn't want to stuff it up. Um, but yeah, there's the technical aspect of recording, editing, publishing. Um, and I think those are skills that you can learn and um, uh, and I would be try encouraging anyone starting out to keep it as simple as possible. Um, and then there's the, I guess, more creative skills around um, yeah, what's the content? So, you know, how do we, what are we, what are we making and why are we making it? And all the stuff we sort of already talked about. Um, and a producer's role, I mean, for me, I, I always saw my role as trying to help performers do their best work and find their most engaged audience. That was always my, I guess, North Star is I, I love performers. I love working with creative people and I was always just trying to enable them to move closer to their best work and find the people that they were most would most connect with um, and so that can look like a million different things that can be you know booking chasing and booking a guest um, or that can be just creating a good environment to perform in you know like um, performing as you know dill it's hard it's it's difficult um it's a really unique and vulnerable place to put yourself and a good producer is is trying to create an environment where that performer feels as safe as they can to be as vulnerable as they can and uh, and hopefully as funny or smart or whatever um so yeah i guess i mean look I, i'll answer that question maybe a little bit better by saying I've, I always have these two buckets in my head um, and one is the content uh, and or the show and one is the team mm -hmm. and I always knew that um, I had to put my energy into both equally and that if the team um, was was out and 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 you know dysfunctional then the content was really hard and it was you know particularly working in comedy, it's very hard for someone to be funny when, you know, there's a, there's a shitty vibe or they're, they're, you know, they're working in an open plan office and everything's loud or, um, you know, whatever it is. So just always trying to think, what does the team need? How do we bring the team together? Um, and if you got that right, then the content or the show just came so much easier. Um, that was always my approach. And I think still in my career, I'm constantly jumping between those two buckets great answer mate there's some great uh insight there in terms of run sheets call sheets um that a producer will help put together what well, they do with us anyway so we'll sort of put a bit of a run sheet together the only way that i've ever done this um and it's it's not of a of a um educated level of teaching on run sheets but i've sort of just done it a bit more like an essay uh, there's always got to be an introduction three topics in different paragraphs and then an outro at the end that sums it all up um, that's the, the way mm -hmm. I'd always give advice to people just how to start a show, um, whether that, that, that mm -hmm. fits for a crime pod, it fits for an interview, it fits for two mates chatting, um, absolutely anything at all. It's the best way to do it, I think. Is there anything else that you would add into that in terms of a little bit of a run sheet for a show? I mean, I just think your you, you point of having a plan and, again, if you're working in a team, um, having, having it written down somewhere is critical because – you know, we might think that we're on the same page about what we're trying to do here, but it's not until we write it down and share it that we have to, we're forced to agree on, you know, where are we going here and what are we trying to do? So yeah, that could look like the running sheet you described, or it could, 
it could be a, it's just a simple sort of um, dot points. Um, but yeah, it is critical. I mean, just planning in general, just preparing, planning. They're back to what we talked about with, with Hamish and Andy. They, they, they still, they could wing it. They could easily wing it <laughs> and just turn up and it would still be the funniest fucking thing you've ever heard. But they plan and they still have, they have a planning meeting with their team where they talk through the ideas and they, um, they build it out and they, they think about how good it can, can, what could we do to make that better? Um, so yeah, pre-production planning. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's like, how serious do you want to take it? Do you want it to be good? And if you want it to be good, then you gotta, you gotta work on it. Incredible. There's two more questions I've got on that to, to finish up, mate, because I know you've been extremely generous with your time. One is a personal one that I've just been thinking is Hamish and Andy, do they share a sheet or do they come prepared with their own facts and hide it from each other? And the second one was, I suppose, that's really interesting in terms of a duo podcast that I've taken a lot of inspiration from with with list cloggers, albeit not as um, preparedly enough as, as it needs to be as yet. But one thing that I you know, had to get a lot better at and drop my ego on or, or learn how the show would work best was playing roles and knowing what role each other mm-hmm. plays. And I think for so long at the start, you know, maybe I used to compete with Dan trying to be the funny guy or trying to be on, on par with him, but really quickly realized like that's not helping anyone. Like let's, it's funnier mm-hmm. when I'm playing my role of being the one that's shit scared, doesn't want to get canceled. Uh, I'm reining <laughs> him in, which to be honest, this is all true. Uh, you know, mm. those bits. And then Dan's this one that is him. So I think there's a really part yeah. there because the inspiration from that obviously came from Hamish and Andy. Like Andy's the uh, organized anal uh, operator. <laughs> it's a funny word, anal, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, yeah. Hamish is, you know, this funny, happy-go-lucky guy that's extremely inquisitive um, and jovial. And I think that that works. If they were both trying to be the same person, it wouldn't work. Oh, totally. I mean... Um and, you know, obviously we're being sort of, um, oh, what's the word? We, you know, we're being black and white to make the point. Obviously, they both can do both. And Hamish is, you know, he's not, he's not a He doesn't rock up and disaster. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. They, they, and Andy is, is you know, in, is one of the funniest blokes I know. So, hey, Sam, but, sorry. Yeah, they late. Before I ask that, who do you think gets more offended? Do you think Hamish gets more offended that he isn't organized? Or that Amy Andy gets more offended that he isn't funny. Uh, neither of them would be offended at all. Okay. <laughs> um, no, 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 neither of them would be offended at all. But I think the, the only reason I bring that up is because it's about exaggerating your strengths. It's not. It's not about um, you know ugh, I can only do this one thing and that's all I'll ever do. It's it's being clear on hey this is my strength so I'm going to lean in to that and you know one of the longest running segments on the show is is upset andy um because <laughs> hamish is fast and loose and, yeah. and andy isn't he likes things just so and so but you know andy he, he's he's he knows that's where that tension is where the comedy is so let's lean into it um and uh so yeah i'm just tracking back to your question about roles it is it is really important to, to, to yeah to know what your strength is and what you bring to the show but more so and I, I can't remember who told me this but I've stolen it and repeated it a million times that the best shows are the shows that come to the mic thinking about what they can do to make their co-hosts sound good hmm. so it's it's, it's going oh, I saw this thing and I know if I bring this up it'll make him go berserk and, and it's that it's that under, not just understanding what your strengths are but understanding what your co-hosts role is and, and what you need to bat up for them to be out of spike that they're the shows that really take off um and and it's back to your point around knowing roles and knowing knowing what we both bring to the table and i can't remember the second part of your question Mate, you've answered it that's that's perfect i really um appreciate that because it's, it's a massive point um to finish up how would you give advice to someone that not to start a podcast but to get into the industry now um, it's a lot, I suppose. It's a it's a it's a growing industry. Whether that be podcasting, um, radio, any style of production, because the big thing that you know I've spoken to a lot of people about, and you mentioned before, Howie, like he spoke about how grateful he was to get a a opportunity behind the screen, and took him time to learn his craft. Whether that was working, you know, running cables, um, you know, being a junior producer, mm-hmm. producer that then got him to where he is now. Um, how would you give that advice to people to join up 
in in that sort of form. Well, I look, I just think the beauty of the world we're living in now is there's no gatekeepers. So there's mm. no, when I was starting my career, there was no YouTube, there was no social media. There were, you know, if you wanted to work in media, you had to find, you had to get a job at a radio station or at a TV network. And, um, you know, it's no um, surprise that so many of my generation's performers came through community radio because that was the sort of easiest way in. Um, but now none of those, none of those gatekeepers exist. So you could literally just find a show to produce, you know, if, if you wanted to be a producer, you, you could like, there's a million podcasts desperate. If someone said, Hey, I can, I can give you five hours a week. I can help you book guests. I can help you come up with some run sheets. I can send you a page of ideas. I could write some jokes, whatever it is. Like you wouldn't have to look too far for someone to take you up on that. So I would find someone who's making something that you can make, you can help make a little bit better. And I would just get in there and volunteer, you know, and that could, um, uh, yeah, that, that would be a blessing for, for most sort of podcasters that are starting out. I mean, every other comedian, if they don't have a podcast, they should. And not all of the, and, and not all of those are with networks or, um, and I just use comedy as an example, but so you know, there's a million ways in that you could that you could start just by by volunteering. Um, now, if you're sort of at the part of your career where you need to make money, um, that's probably a little more challenging. And I'd probably deal tell people to go to open universities um, to get a. <laughs> Is that, is that a client? They're, they're, they're Open Universities Australia, <laughs> mind you. That they actually, we, we do Sorry. speak to Josh um, at the end, and there actually is courses, funnily enough, that I actually had no idea about. I didn't really. Can you imagine? Can you uh, believe there is a course in podcasting these days, which you will find out? Well, there um, should be. That makes yeah. total sense. And look, a lot of the um, a lot of the producers I work with now have been through afters or have been through a more formal um, education. I just. Yeah, I guess when I started my career, that that wasn't available. But learning the technical skills through um, more formal uh, uh, establishments, I think, would be really helpful. Like, I wouldn't hire someone who can't edit in Pro Tools or Reaper or, or one of those software. Um, uh, so, yeah, l learn how the recording gear works, learn how to edit. You know, there's free edit software that you can practice on. So th those bits are sort of easy to get and then the more I guess creative performance based stuff you're going to have to find someone or if you can't find someone do the show yourself 100% they want, I just want to double down on what you were saying before and it's always a message that I send through is volunteering and you know money can be the devil in all things but I think as soon as you're getting in early the more you can volunteer for free because it comes with no expectations you don't have to know with what you're doing no one can get angry at you because you're not getting paid and you're this genuinely there for mm -hmm. a helping hand. You learn so much. Um, it's a lot less stress-free because you're, you're literally just there to, to be a part of it and you'll learn so much more. Plus the relationships and the respect that you'll, you'll get from that is uh, immeasurable. The asterisk on that though is like find someone you can genuinely add value to. Like yep. no one needs another, hey, just, you know, I'll just, I'll just hang around and, you know, I'll do the photocopying. Like actually do the, you do, do the thinking bit as well to go, hey, I've yeah. noticed that you do X, Y, and Z and I thought I could do this A, B, and C, which might help you, you know, like do the thinking part as well because no one needs just work experience. People need, gen like I think that's really critical it is. as well when it comes to volunteering. Ex exactly right. Um, Sammy, mate, you've been absolutely incredible today. I cannot thank you enough for your time, expertise, your leadership, and genuinely just being an incredible person. You've given me so much over my uh, small journey in this space with our relationship, the advice that you've you've given. I, I honestly can't thank you enough. And to come on here today to give it to everyone else for for free and just to help and to to do that, it, it's uh, it's a credit to yourself, mate. So thank you so much, uh, mate. That's very generous. Thank you. Um, was was chuffed to be asked and. Um, congratulations to to what you've built. I think you, uh, I'd probably put you, the Shameless Girls, and uh, probably there's a couple of other pockets. I won't go through them all, but in, in that you are creating the model of what a modern media company can look like. And I just, um, I've certainly learned more from watching what you've done than, than you've learned from me, I can tell you that. So congratulations. Right, right. Tingles, mate, it means a lot. I really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to getting up to Byron for a beer soon. Please do. 
Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that chat with Sam Kavanagh. He's an absolute legend and an icon in this industry. So I hope you know how lucky we are to sit down with him. I sure do. It was unbelievable. If it's a time to start a podcast, now is the time. You've just had one of the best producers in the country sitting down and talking through it. I feel inspired. I might even start another one. Now I'm joined by Josh, who's an advisor from Open Universities Australia. Hey Josh, just had an incredible episode with Sam Kavanagh, industry leader and absolute goat of the industry. Before we get into the chat about higher education, what does Open Universities Australia do? Yeah, so Open Universities Australia, where think of us as like an online marketplace for higher education. So we're partnered with 27 universities around Australia, and we're here to support you throughout your whole education journey. Uh, and it could be the enrollment process or even the application for a course. And we'll be providing ongoing support with future enrollments and things like that throughout your whole study journey. So cool. So people can come to you with any questions, any form of study that they're looking to get into, whether it be part-time, full-time, and help find what's best for them and and suited for their level of uh, education. That is correct. So no matter what level of study that you have done, we'll be able to assist you with getting started with university study. Teach me, please, podcasting. Now, when I was doing this, when I was looking to get into podcasting, there was absolutely nothing online about it. (laughs) People didn't even know what it was. They used to laugh about it. Don't tell me these days you can actually study podcasting. Is that true? A pioneer idea, this guy. <laughs> Incredible. But, uh, I should be teaching the courses. I know, right? I might have to get you in for it. <laughs> but um, there is actually, we've, I've actually come across an individual subject specifically for podcasting. So it is within the major of uh, digital media. And there are some subjects within there that you can be looking at journalism, writing, production, you know, structuring of uh, you know, media communications. But then there's also an individual subject within podcasting where basically you're going to learn how to actually, uh, you know, do it, do your own podcast. Love it. That's so interesting because, as I said, there was nothing like this when I was sort of looking at getting through. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in if you are good at production and you're good at putting a show together, it just makes you an absolute better podcaster all around. How does this course look? Is it something that you can do part-time, full-time? You can you can even do it within a Bachelor of Arts oh. or a Bachelor of Business. Uh, some of these subjects are available without any entry requirements, but as it is part of the degree structure, usually what we see is students need to be admitted into the degree. You were saying before about completing full uh, degrees or just studying in subjects. Is it possible to then just study a couple of the subjects or is it best to just maybe book a consultation with yourself and see what's available for the specific person? Yeah, definitely. So there is that option still to study those individual subjects and every student is different. So you're able to uh, have a conversation with one of the student advisors through book a consultation and we'll be able to find the best course or best individual subjects for your needs. So there you have it guys, that's super exciting. Make sure if you want to look at doing some higher education and you don't know where you want to go, make sure you go to open.edu.au, chat with Josh about what it is if you want to study full-time, part-time, any subject and he can help you put it into the best one possible that will make you uh, as easy as possible and you enjoy yourself. Sounds great, I couldn't have put it any better so... That's it. Thank you so much.